Are you going to be, are you monitoring the chat and picking the questions? Okay. I'm monitoring the chat, picking the questions as well. Um, and I think we'll start in about a couple more moments. Thank you guys for coming. And especially during a very monumental mm -hmm. day. I hope Good I did. day. <laughs> <laughs> and like, what better way to celebrate and talk about publishing? And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's what everyone is thinking. <laughs> um, I think maybe in like two minutes or so. Hey, Libby, do you want us to do like five minutes? Yeah, I would say like two to five minutes, like um, whenever sort of feels comfortable, but like spread out and like add some detail about um, yeah, just sort of how your career has progressed. And yeah, that's right. What I can do is actually put everyone's bios up for a moment so people can just kind of familiarize themselves as they arrive. And yeah, we'll just take maybe 4.05. But thanks so much everybody for being here. Okay. And I'll just go, I guess, in the order of like the bios are. So yeah, I'll start with Andy then Sarah, then Tom, then Molly. Just really quickly, Tom, what's the correct pronunciation of your last name? Uh, Holer. Holer, okay, let me get that right, cool. I think I got everyone else. Thank you for asking. All right, it's officially 4.05. Um, to everyone that is here, I just wanna give a hearty welcome and thank you for coming on this Wednesday. Um, Wednesday on the Stoops is a series of free programming by Zoom every Wednesday from four to 5 p.m. My name's Maya and I'm the program manager at Blue Stoop. And these sessions are essentially designed to be a constant structure every Wednesday where we hope to plug you into the writing energy. And this is quite a really special Wednesday on the Stoop. It is the first of a three-part series of meetings with representatives from Penguin Random House, focusing on job pathways and real life experiences of being a literary editor. Um, we are so grateful to the folks at Penguin Random House for wanting to collaborate with us and really just present publishing as a space outside of New York and introduce people to the nitty gritty behind the scenes action of publishing and what it means to be an editor. And I'm going to um, send it off to Libby Burton, but I wanted to share 
um, the wonderful representatives that will be talking about their jobs. Um, Andy Ward, Sarah Peed, Tom Holler, Molly Turpin. Thank you guys so much for coming. And pretty much the structure of this um, session will be introduction, telling their story, how their jobs have evolved or changed, and then a Q&A. I ask you if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat and I will be monitoring them um, once everyone is done presenting. Um, and with that being said, in terms of like house news, I will send this off to Libby. Thank you, Maya. Um, and thank you guys for joining. This is really exciting. Um, so many people are interested in, in publishing. Um, so I brought a bunch of editors with me today who have who edit a variety of books and sort of have different paths to how they got to where they are. So um, I'm excited to hear more about that myself um, from all of my colleagues. And my name is Libby Burton. I'm an executive editor at Crown, um, which is an imprint at Penguin Random House. So um, we're just gonna dive in and we'll start with Andy Ward. You'll see his bio is in the chat. Uh, he's the publisher of Random House. Um, but yeah, Andy, tell us a little bit about your journey through publishing. <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks, Libby and Maya. Thanks for having us here on the stoop. It's good to be with everybody. Um, so I'm Andy, I work at Random House. I work uh, closely with Molly, who you see on the screen as well, I think. Um, my publishing, I, I'll try to, I'll condense this as much as possible, but it's a bit of a weird journey. Um, I started out in publishing uh, out of college. I worked in book publishing for two years at uh, Little Brown, which was at that point, this is going way back now, we're in the, we're in the early 90s. So um, Little Brown was a Boston-based uh, publishing house that had just moved to New York. And um, I got a job there working for the director of trade paperbacks. I didn't know what that job was really gonna be like. I graduated from college with a, you know, as an English major and I knew that I liked to read books and I would edit all my um, friends in college. I would work on their essays with them and sort of liked to do that, but I didn't really know what of a job in book publishing would be. And it, as it turned out, the job that I ended up with was not um, a job that I uh, was cut out for or really enjoyed very much. Um, Little Brown was a, is, a, is a great publisher, but it was, um, at the time, still very much like a old, very old, old world, old school Boston publishing house. And um, the editors there had been there, they were like tenured professors in a way. They'd been there for, for many, many, many years. And the younger staffers um, just didn't have a whole lot of opportunity, I think, to sort of develop the skills that um, you, you know, that you need to become an editor. And that was clear to me very early on. Um, and that was frustrating to me. Also, you know, the job that I had working for this uh, director of trade paperbacks was not, in fact, a real editorial job. Um, his job was to take uh, books that other editors had had worked on at Little Brown and to make sort of repackage them as paperbacks. Um, he wasn't editing, you know, on the page. He wasn't acquiring books. Um, so, uh, you know, it did. It just didn't feel to me like it was going to be the job or necessarily the place where I was um, going to uh, to grow as an editor. And you know, sort of the opportunities available to to younger people there were pretty few and far between. I mean, this is in these days and at Little Brown, um, assistants didn't sit at the conference table with the editors. You sat in chairs around the edge of the room and you were not, you were not invited to speak in meetings or to, to offer opinions. Um, so it just, it, it really, um, I didn't like the job very much. I'll be completely honest. So after two years, I left, I actually left book publishing and I went into magazines. And I took a job as a, a researcher. It was a freelance job. This is paid by the hour for a special issue that Esquire magazine produced every year. And I took a job there as a, as a fact checker basically for three months, which turned into um, an ed editorial assistant job. And I stayed there for seven years and became features editor of the magazine and um, really got um, a very sort of, um, uh, 360 degree um, editorial experience um, without really having a whole lot of like knowledge base at the time. So you just sort of things were thrown at you to do and you kind of figure it out and you're writing and you're editing and you're assigning pieces, um, which was a part of this uh, 
the job that I really, really loved, which is essentially means you would come up with an idea for a story and you would go out and find an author, a writer who could make that story happen. And then it would end up in the magazine. That was a hugely exciting and gratifying uh, to me. And um, I think, you know, just the magazine world has obviously changed a lot since I was in it. Um, but there was just an, a kind of a, a much broader range of experience and opportunity available to a younger person, I think, than the book world offered at that point. So I worked uh, at Esquire magazine for seven years. Then I went over to GQ magazine. This is basically the same kind of job, but at a magazine with a much bigger budget and, and sort of more, uh, which meant you could work on more ambitious pieces by really great writers. And I worked there for seven years as well as an editor. And uh, so after almost 15 years in magazines, I came back to books uh, 10 years ago at Random House because uh, ultimately I never really cared about the mag. I never cared about magazines so much. I cared a lot about the stories that I worked on and, um, and that was fun. But at a certain point it became, I think sort of like the larger enterprise didn't mean a whole lot to me. And books always did mean a lot to me. Um, and the idea of going back to that was hugely appealing to me. So um, I was lucky enough to end up uh, at Random House and um, at, you know, working on a, at an imprint with a list of books that just fit sort of my own, um, like why is, I have a sort of wide range of interests and it's a place where you can pursue almost any kind of book as an editor. Um, some editors love that. Other editors have much more specific um, things that they want to work on, and that's cool too. And you'll, you might hear from some of them today. But um, uh, there was something about the Random House list that that really appealed to me, and ended up being um, a good fit. And I've been there um, now for a little more than ten years, and have had the you know the good fortune and opportunity to work on just a really um, always ever changing, exciting list of books with. Um, you know, a group of authors that I, that I care a lot about and that I learn a lot from. And, uh, you know, the good, the good thing about this job, um, I'm sure you'll hear this from all of our panelists today, is that um, every book is different. Every list is different. Um, you're never really doing the same thing twice. So that's, that's uh, sort of what it's all about for me. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my circuitous journey um, through the book publishing and magazine publishing world. But uh, it's nice to be here with you guys today and happy to answer any questions when we're all done. Awesome, thank you, Andy. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah, who is a senior editor at Delray Books. Um, so yeah, Sarah, tell us a little bit, tell us about Delray, tell us about the books you work on and sort of your publishing journey as well too. Yeah, of course. Um, so Delray Books, is a science fiction, fantasy, and horror imprint. Um, so to put it plainly, we're giant nerds. I work with Tom a lot, so you'll hear from him right after. Um, and uh, I ended up there in kind of an interesting way. Uh, all throughout college, I had been interning at a lot of different publishing houses, um, many of them very small, so that I got to do a lot of different jobs, not just editorial, but worked on marketing and publicity and production, which I learned very quickly is not for me. I'm very bad at it. Um, so, you know, learned a lot of strengths and limitations, uh, figured out pretty quickly that editorial is where I wanted to end up ultimately. I, I actually interned at a lot of academic presses. So for a while, I thought I was going to work in academic publishing. And uh, I almost took a job with Oxford University Press, actually. And that same day, I got a call from Random House saying, hey, we see on your resume that you are, uh, to put it very politely, a gigantic nerd uh, based on a couple of these internships that you've listed. Would you want to work with our science fiction and fantasy imprint as a publishing assistant? And I leapt at that chance because please, if you're going to pay me to be a nerd, I'm going to take that opportunity. Um, so started working at Delray and I have been there ever since. Uh, sort of my, my dream team of, of working on many different kinds of projects, uh, as Andy mentioned. Uh, I do work occasionally on licensing, but my, my good friend Tom Holler will be able to speak much more thoroughly to that than I will. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, I've been there for almost 10 years. What is time? Who knows? Um, 
but it's been a it's been a pretty exciting journey. I'm sorry, mine's much much faster and much less exciting uh, than Andy's. Um, Sarah, do you do fiction exclusively fiction or any nonfiction as well too? Uh, pretty much exclusively fiction. The closest I come to nonfiction is I also work on the Minecraft publishing program. That is my foray into licensing. So. Hey, if there's any Minecrafters out there, I am happy to answer your Minecraft questions. Uh, and we publish those guidebooks as well as the novels, um, which you know has led to its own fun kind of learning process because you kind of have to switch on different editorial brains depending on the project you're working on. And I have found licensing to just be an absolute joy. You get to work with so many different authors on so many different projects. But that's the closest I come to nonfiction is Minecraft guidebooks. Very cool, man. Well, thank you. Um, okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Tom. And I'm, um, Tom is an editor at Delray as well, Tom Holler. And I want to give us like an overview on like licensing, Tom, like as though we have no idea what, what it is. And uh, I don't know much about it anyway. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, then tell us about your, your journey as well, too. Sure thing. Um, um, so yes, I'm, a, I'm an editor at Delray. I work um, closely with Sarah um, and have since I started there in 2014. Um, and uh, I will, uh, I'll, I'll go through my background first, but then I will, I will explain the word licensing, which is a weird word um, that means a bunch of weird things. Uh, so uh, publishing is actually my second career. Uh, I'm a former um, accountant and taxation um, <laughs> professional. Um, I worked as a tax accountant uh, for a while. Um, that's what I originally studied and went to school for. Um, but really quickly out of college, I um, decided that that wasn't what I wanted to do forever. Um, didn't really enjoy it um, for maybe obvious reasons, but uh, it wasn't all that exciting, let's put it that way. And so I decided that I wanted to go into publishing because publishing and reading and books and working on stories was the kind of thing that I always did in the periphery of my education and studying to become an accountant. So, you know, doing things like working on college newspaper and doing freelance editing for literature annuals and college radio and stuff like that. So because that was always on the periphery when I really thought about like, well, what do I really want to do long term? I said, oh, okay, publishing. So um, I sort of um, got into publishing by going back to school and grad school and internship route because I knew that as much as I thought my skills that I learned in accounting, things like being organized and diligent and, and you know, being super um, granular in terms of being able to analyze data, all that stuff translates to publishing or, or any job really. Um, I also knew that if an accountant applied for an edit editor's job, that someone might look at my resume and think that I had confusingly applied for the wrong job. I needed something on that piece of paper that said that I knew words just as well as I knew numbers. Um, so I did that and then um, did an internship at Delray um, was a summer intern um, because I cold emailed an editor whose email I found posted on the internet, um, which is like um, the needle, you know, finding a needle in a haystack sort of thing, because that doesn't ever happen. Um, but I did internship and I did a lot of freelance editorial work. I did temporary temp work in the industry, just at a few different places, gathering up experience and just applying to jobs. Um, and then one day, um, actually very shortly after I took a full-time position at another publisher, about a week later, I got a phone call saying, hey, you know, you were our intern way back when, we've got a, a, a brand new um, assistant position, would you like to apply and, and maybe join us? Um, and much like Sarah, um, I jumped at the chance um, because I grew up reading all sorts of nerdy sci-fi fantasy books and that's what I wanted to work on. Um, so um, it was a no-brainer to come work for Delray. Um, which is a good segue into sort of how my career has changed and that one of the things uh, in my editorial career, and I think it's probably common for most editors, is you start off, you know, as an assistant, you start off very much in support of other editors, learning how to be an editor by working closely with other editors. And you're not just learning the sort of mechanics and the, the processes of how to be an editor, but you're also learning about what kind of editor you want to be in the future. What kind of books do you really, are you really passionate about? What kind of stories do you really want to publish when you become, you know, uh, an editor with more autonomy? And one of the things that I got experience in and suddenly realized that I really enjoyed was licensing. And licensing is sort of just a fancy way of saying that um, I partner with um, really big pop culture brands and really big pop culture uh, entities like the team that makes Star Wars at Lucasfilm, um, the folks that make Stranger Things, uh, the team that does Critical Role and uh, the video game company Blizzard Entertainment that makes World of Warcraft, et cetera. 
So I partner with them to create books and tell stories in their world. So I, we, I basically get to play in someone else's sandbox. I get to go play with the action figures essentially. Um, and I work with them to find authors and to find stories that work for the kinds of worlds they have, the kinds of stories they wanna tell. Um, and so it's, it's similar to um, the other kinds of editorial you might work with, just finding an author and publishing their book. But you have that extra hat of having to manage some extra relationships, um, as you can imagine. Um, different companies have different rules and standards about everything from the kinds of words that you can or cannot use in their books. For instance, if you're working on a Star Wars story, all of your measurements need to be in metric because Star Wars uses the metric system. Uh, so you won't find feet or miles in Star Wars, you know, it's meters and kilometers and stuff. Um, all the way to having, you know, standards for how their characters need to be drawn if you're doing artwork for their covers, stuff like that. So um, licensing is this kind of um, extra branch of publishing that's a lot of fun because you know, every story is different, but I just get to play in all these different worlds all the time, you know, from, you know, one day to the next um, and get to work with these brands and these stories and these worlds that I grew up loving, that I still love, that I still love consuming, you know, as a reader, as a video game player, as a, as a moviegoer, but I get to help contribute to them in a, you know, in a small way alongside like a bunch of creators and storytellers. Um, so it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's an extra bit of challenge, but um, it's the kind of thing that once I started working in publishing, I just fell naturally into and was like, oh, this is this is this is the corner of publishing I belong in. Like this is exactly what I've been looking for. That is awesome. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think that sentiment of like finding where you belong and sort of finding the books and the ideas and the writers that you feel comfortable in is like something that we can all sort of attest to. And it takes it can take a while. Um, but it's it's great when it happens. Um and finally, I'm going to turn to Molly Turpin, who is an editor at Random House. Um, yeah, Molly, tell us a little bit about, about your career, how it's changed, and the kind of books you do. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Molly. I work um, at Random House on Andy's team, where I work on all nonfiction books. Um, my books span history, journalism, economics. Um, I do what we call serious nonfiction, which I always feel is kind of unfair because I think they're really fun. Um, my career, I think, sort of the way Tom described it feels totally right to me. It feels like it's been an evolution. I've been at Random House uh, for about eight years, and I started here as an editorial assistant really like three months after I graduated from college. Um, so I feel like I've grown up as an editor at Random House working with, at this point, um, five different editors and publishers. So I've really gotten to see how different editors work on their books, how different publishers sort of look at the list and um, and really from them and also from working on my own books, as Tom said, describe, like become the, the kind of editor I wanna be and decide the kind of books that I wanna work on. And it feels like it's been an evolution to becoming um, a more independent editor and, you know, and gradually acquire more of my own list. Um, I came to book publishing because in college I was a history major, but I also spent pretty much all of my time outside of class working on the student newspaper. And I really loved not just the writing and reporting of it, but I also loved the editing of it and seeing the whole thing come together every week. It was a weekly and working with the whole team. And I feel like when I was looking for an editorial career afterwards and jobs, I was kind of chasing the feeling that I got from working with the team on my student newspaper in college. And I still feel that way about working at Random House where every book feels sort of team oriented, whether it's you and the author in it together or you and the publicist and the production folks all working to put the book together. Um, I, after college, I um, did this thing called the Columbia Publishing Course. And it was really helpful as a crash course in what book publishing was, because prior to that, I really had no idea about book publishing. I knew a little bit about newspapers and a little bit about magazines from internships, but I didn't know anything about the book publishing world um, and was very fortunate to um, land a job at Random House with a nonfiction editor and with our deputy publisher. Um, I don't think I even knew at the time just how good of a fit that was, but sort of the longer I've stayed at Random House, the more the fit has felt exactly right. Um, and since then, I've gradually sort of little by little acquired my own books um, and built a list that I'm really excited about that includes, again, journalists like Zach Carter, who wrote about John Maynard Keynes, um, which I don't know, to hear Sarah talk about herself as a big nerd, I feel 
like a very different kind of nerd um, when I think about my books, like like for history and econ and um, and just all the stuff that I get really excited about. And then I'm excited to share with readers when when we find the right people to write about them. I mean, I think um, the privilege of editing books and for me working on nonfiction is that I feel like every single author I work with is the smartest person in the world about whatever it is they're writing about and to get to work with them closely on those books and learn from them is just the coolest job in the world. So it's been it's been a real a real treat to sort of become an editor at Random House. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you all. And I think I guess I'll turn it over to Maya now. Um, if you're going to pull some questions from the Q and A, which we already have a very good question to start with. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, um, thank you all so much. And yeah, I'm very excited about this question from Laura. Laura says, hey all, so question re, the corners of publishing that Tom mentioned, if licensing is one corner, what are the others? What other kinds of editor can you be? And feel free. Oh, open to the group, yeah. Everyone yeah. jump in, <laughs> anyone jump. So um, I guess, there, so there's a few ways that you can, um, there's a few ways you could categorize this. Obviously you can, um, the kinds of editors you can be could be different just by genre. So if you're a science fiction, fantasy, novel, you know, editor, um, if you work on nonfiction, you know, in history versus econ versus the sciences, um, if you're doing, um, uh, if you're an editor of graphic novels, things like that, that's one way to splice it. Um, uh, and that's probably the way that you will hear a lot of editors talk about their work. Um, but I guess there's also the level of editor of you can have editors who are editors who really are just focused on like acquiring the projects, acquisitions editors. Um, you can have people who are editors who um, actually work to take the projects that have been bought and acquired and found and develop them and hone them into the best version of themselves. Um, you know, working directly with the authors uh, to you know do revisions to talk through you know everything from pacing to character arc, et cetera. Probably some of if you imagine like oh what what do I think an editor is probably that's the kind of editor that you you might be most familiar with. And then there are other sort of editors like copy editors and proofreaders who are involved in you know the style and the grammar and the mechanics of a written piece and honing it you know to again be the best version of itself. So there, there are like all these different layers to being an editor and kinds of being editors, um, but you can wear multiple of those hats. I think for many of us, you know, you wear, wear sort of the acquisitions editor hat as well as being development editor, editors. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not so good with the grammar and the style. I try, but I rely very much on my copy editing um, team um, who are, are wizards at all that. But um, so there's a lot of different types, but I would say that there's a big, you know, there's a lot of overlap. The Venn diagrams are, are, are pretty overlapped of the kinds of editors. I feel like Tom absolutely nailed it on the head. And I, Tom, just so I want you to know I'm in your corner, I'm also like, I could never be a copy editor because they have such an incredible level of skill and attention to detail that I will never forget one of the projects I was editing, a copy editor flagged a word usage and I believe it was the word cross punch in a battle scene in this like Victorian era steampunk fantasy novel I was working on back in the day and they were like this takes place in this year and cross punch wasn't invented as a term until like 1918 so technically you couldn't have this word and I was like oh I could never be a copy editor like I just am not I'm not that detail oriented um so yeah, there are there are many different levels and many different required skill sets. Yeah, and I, I would just I think that's exactly right, and I think the the copy editing track is different than the editing track. So if if something like you know if you are somebody who loves grammar and you're incredibly detail oriented and that's what you you know take pleasure in, that's that's a clear track to that job. It's just not the track same track as being, you know, an acquiring editor at a place like Random House or Delray. That's a different, it's a different skill set. I do not have the copy editing skill set either. Um, and I'm, the people that we have doing that for us are incredible and I'm grateful for them all the time, but it's really a very different job. Um, it, it ran, speaking for Random House, at least, it's just about, you know, identifying writers and projects that, um, that you both care about and think that you can sell and then working with those authors to make to make the books as as good as they can possibly be like that's sort of what it ultimately comes down to and then um 
in terms of like what kind of editors there can be, you know, I, I think there are, like we were talking about before, a lot of the editors at the Random House imprint edit a really broad range of books. They have, they're sort of more defined by their interests than they are by a certain kind of book. But there are, all, there are editors across the industry who only work on business books, who only work on science fiction, who only work on cookbooks. And that's great too. Like that's, one is not better than the other. It's just that there are different sort of um, tacks that you can take as an editor as you work to define yourself and, and try to figure out like, ultimately where do you want to end up as an editor, right? Who do you want to be as an editor? Do you want to be somebody who um, edits um, big four color um, cookbooks or do you want to be somebody who edits poetry collections or do you want to be somebody who edits, um, you know, like romance novels? All those things are, are possible. It's just, you don't, and you don't have to know that when you're starting out in the business necessarily, but it is good to have sort of a, to be working on a vision for who you want to ultimately be as an editor. Amazing. Um, thank you for that. Um, we kind of have two questions that are slightly similar. And also we had to say uh, goodbye to Libby. Uh, she had a, another meeting at 4.30, um, but we have quite a bit of questions. William in the chat asks, is it really possible to make a career in publishing without living in New York? If so, what are your recommendations to find more regional publishing houses? And we also have a sort of adjacent question from, Cam from Jordan Cameron, who says, do you think that the industry is moving in the direction of offering more remote opportunities to allow people outside of NYC to get into publishing? Let me take this. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do think. Yeah, I do think everything's changing right now for sure, and I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know that we just hired an editorial assistant, right, Molly, who lives in California, um, and he uh, was our intern before that. Yeah, and he, we've never met him, um, and he's living in Pasadena, and I think he wants to move. Um, he wants to move to New York. Um, possibly in the late fall, but, but I'm not sure. And ultimately, um, I think we'll see more of that. And I don't know that we'll be back five days a week in, in, in an office in New York, who knows? But oh, I don't and, and, Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Mark. I was just gonna say, and you say we've never met him, but I feel like he makes himself known all the time in meetings and has been a really great presence. I've been surprised and impressed by how present we can be with each other, I think, over Zoom. Amazing. Yeah. So I don't think that's the obstacle that it would have been. I don't think the industry had its head around anybody working remotely before. They just, you had to sort of, everybody has to be in the office and you have to be in New York. And that has changed drastically over the last year, obviously. So um, we'll see where it goes. Just to even like piggyback off those two questions, um, what has it been like for you all to work remotely? Have there been any like big changes that you feel are for the best or um, how's the adjustment been? I thought, it, I think it's been surprisingly smooth. Um, you know, I think the biggest disappointment is like, it's gonna sound really like um, cheesy, but it, the biggest disappointment I think is just not going into work and like seeing my colleagues who I genuinely enjoy seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but when it comes to doing, just getting the work done, it hasn't been, I don't know, it hasn't been as disruptive as I thought it might be. Yeah, I agree. Um, and one of the things is that particularly as editors, you know, a lot of editorial work is sometimes done outside of the kind of nine to five of the office, particularly the, the reading and editing parts, because a lot of times when we were in the office, the day to day, there's meetings and it's kind of keeping all the books, you know, moving, keeping all the trains running on time. So, you know, talking to other parts of the publishing process, your marketing team, your production team, um, and so a lot of the reading that I do be just be after hours at my in my apartment or at home anyway. So the fact that that's now kind of you know more of your regular schedule hasn't uh, Molly's right hasn't really created um, a whole lot of um, disruptment because to be an editor at least you know I have my laptop um, and an internet connection and that's you know kind of all I need. So you can kind of you can do a lot of that work almost anywhere. Um, and yeah, the the only part that's been taken some uh, some learning curve is um, 
just hanging out more on on video chat with people i had to buy a printer that that that's been an improvement but that was the one the one thing that really had to happen i, I still need to buy a printer i really i think i really need to now uh, actually do it put it off too long I am moments away from breaking down and buying a printer because it would be nice to not read everything on a computer screen all the time. But it is nice to get a lot of my work reading done, not like on a sub, like very crowded subway car with like my phone pressed against my face, trying to, to read in the hour to and from work, uh, which is when I got a lot of my, my reading done. And Sarah, you and I were on the same train line. We'd run into each other, I think, doing that same, that same thing all the time. Yeah, getting on that F train, super fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything that, that my fellow panelists have said. I think I do, it is really hard not to see people, I think, from, at least for me. Um, that's a big part of the job, um, interacting with people, having, you know, we, we had an ideas meeting in our editorial department, what was that, a week or two ago, Molly? Yeah. And uh, that's something that we used to do all in a, we'd all get in a big conference room and order pizzas and sit around and sort of just bad ideas around and um, stuff like that is harder to do on Zoom. It's just not, it's not the same thing. It's not as, you're just missing that human element that I think um, makes a lot of what we do easier and probably better. But I think, but there are really good things about working from home too. And I think in, for the most part, we've demonstrated that we can do all of the things that we need to do to make the business run from our, from our dining room tables or whatever. So um, it's, we're, we're, so, we're incredibly lucky that that's the case with our business. A lot of businesses do not, um, have not been really been able to function the way that we've been able to. It's just more, there is a, there is a human connection part of the business that, um, at least on our side with authors and agents that we're seeing all the time and talking to all the time that when you don't really see people, it does get pretty, gets pretty tough. Oh yeah, the, the general like uh, con of the pandemic for sure. Um, and I also had to invest in a printer uh, for my own work from home purposes. We have a really great question from Chessa um, who says, hello, I'm a senior philosophy major English minor at the University of Texas at Austin. I've always been the type to edit all my friends' papers and I love it. I decided recently that editing sounded like a great fit for me. I'm really nervous that I won't have the right connections to get to the place I would like to be. Do you have any advice on how to get started in publishing? It's such a good question. Um, I don't know, I'll be, I'll be interested to hear it. Everybody, everybody else says, I think for me, the publishing course did the same thing, but I know that there's a huge barrier to get there, which is, which is the cost of it. I think, I think internships more and more are the way to go and more and more they are actually paid. Um, yeah, I don't know, but it, it really is a challenge. And I think, I hope it's getting better um, actually and having that be one pro of the pandemic that, that there's sort of a more openness both to geographic range of candidates um, and doing it remotely so so that you don't have to come to New York and be here. Yeah, I mean, I think the publishing course is, is a really good gateway for sure. But as Molly said, that's not something that is you know, avail available to everybody or, so, you know, there's a, there is a barrier to entry there. Um, I think our internship program at Penguin Random House has just in the past, I don't know, what do you guys think? Like five years, um, really taken a huge leap forward. A, it's paid, as Molly said, which is a huge deal um, and was a long time coming. But also the candidates that we're getting out of that program are fantastic. And a lot of them are getting hired. Um, and I, I really do think that if you come, as an, come in as an intern and you do a three month stint at an, at an imprint or with a, working with a couple of different imprints and you and you do well and people like you, they're gonna try to find ways to, to help you out and to, and to find you a job and to you know, keep, as, keep the talent um, in the company, which is always the goal. So um, to me, that's sort of the best, the best way in, but I know those spots are very limited. Um, so what do you guys, Sarah and Tom, what do you think? I, I am a strong proponent of internships always, uh, just 
you know, that's how I got my start. And I think it's a good way to make connections. But as I sort of talked about a little bit earlier, I think it's also a good way to sort of feel out the different jobs within publishing, um, just to make sure, you know, that editorial really is your fit, that maybe marketing's not your fit. There are so many jobs um, that I think, you know, you should always be open to exploring and checking out. Um, another avenue in terms of making connections, um, I feel like social media and setting up sort of informational interviews with editors. I mean, we tend to be a fairly approachable bunch. I know Tom always has a standing offer to have informational interviews. I do as well, although I say that and I'm like not particularly active on social media at the moment, but you know, reach out, say hi, we're friendly. Um, and we're always willing to talk, you know, I, I feel like that's another way to, to sort of reach out and get to know people, get to know their tastes, uh, create those kinds of connections as well. Yeah, um, to emphasize what Sarah said, anything that you can do um, when you're getting started out, just to learn more about publishing in the industry and learn more about the places where you think you might be a fit versus the things like, oh, you know, that's interesting, but I don't know that that's, you know, where I want to direct my, you know, my long-term career towards. And anything that you can do kind of upfront to try to parse that out is really helpful because publishing is big. It's also a little bit strange. It's a little bit weird. You know, sometimes it's a little hard to parse or understand, particularly from the outside. So informational interviews like that is helpful. The other thing that you can do like on a, on a, um, on a basic level, um, aside from applying to internships, is just look around locally if your school has a writing center that is somewhere that you might be able to get some small experience on, or does your school have a university press? Um, uh, my guess is something like University of Texas at Austin might have one because it's a really big school, but those are places where you might be able to um, do things like internships or maybe even just some, some extra work or find people that you can sit down and have conversations with locally who you can learn more about publishing and the publishing process from, um, you know, if you're not currently ready or able to, you know, make the jump towards connecting with, you know, a big publishing house in New York or between those times when you might be doing that. There's always something you probably can do locally as well as like looking at the wider industry. Um, so that, that's worth exploring too. Thank you. Uh, Samantha also has a really interesting follow-up question. Um, have you found that internships are typically limited to recent students? Is there a way for career changes to get their foot in the door? Well, just circling back to our, the editorial assistant that we just hired, who is our intern, Daryl. Um, Daryl has, he has a master's in English um, and then he worked as a teacher um, for a time, a couple of years, an English teacher. And then he was on the side, he was um, doing some editing for, I think a romance imprint, right Molly? I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, um, and he was doing that because he just loves books and he wanted to get into the business. And um, I think that probably helped him get the internship at, at Penguin Random House. Um, so I, I tell you all that just to suggest that, no, it's not just recent, recent college graduates. Um, Daryl's been out of college for a few years. He's already tried a different career. Um, don't let that stop you if it's a thing that you want to be doing. Um, yeah. I would also just add to the internships. Don't just look at publishing companies, but also check out agencies. I think Writer's House in particular has a great internship program, um, but the work that you'll do as an intern is gonna be very similar at an agency as it would be at a publishing house. You'll probably be reading a lot of submissions and just helping people keep their lives organized. Um, and you'll still get a great view and foot in the door in, um, in the industry. Nice, thank you. Um, I think we have about three more questions that I think will take up the bulk rest of the session. Um, we have another question from Laura. Uh, thinking about the process of acquiring a book, what does that look like? Is it wading through a bunch of submitted manuscripts from hopeful writers? Do you pursue slash source books from authors based on, say, their short story or blog publications? How much responsibility of that discovery falls to the acquisitions editor? And I know that was a lot of questions, so <laughs> take your time. Molly, why don't you take this one? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so I can speak to it for nonfiction. Um, a lot of it we get through agents. So I spend, especially pre-pandemic times, would have spent, you know, maybe would have gone to lunch with an agent maybe one or two days 
a week um, just to keep up my network and agents jobs are really to hustle and um, and do a lot of uh, kind of the R&D work of publishing, which is finding out the people who need to be writing books and bringing those to editors and pitching them to us uh, with proposals. So I'm sort of always reading through submissions and always feeling a little bit behind in them, um, which is exciting to see. But we also try really hard to do some of that discovery work for ourselves. Um, I think Andy in particular is really good at encouraging all of us to always be looking out for somebody who should have a book. So for instance, this June, I'm publishing a book um, by a historian named Taya Miles, who I met, uh, gosh, four years ago now, um, at a history conference and sort of got in the habit of going to conferences and just finding historians who I thought could write for a trade audience and should be speaking to a wider group of people. And Taya was one um, I met and just kept really just kept bugging her for a year and a half until, <laughs> until um, we managed to get her next book. And I'm so excited that it will be coming out in June. Um, but we're all, those of us who are working in nonfiction, and I would imagine similarly for people in fiction with short story writers are, are sort of constantly looking for a great journalist or a great historian or keeping an eye on university press lists or magazines or just, you know, sort of doing that work for ourselves of sniffing out the next great author because we don't want to just depend on agents to do that work for us. Oh, Sarah, we can't hear you. No, you're muted, weird. Oh no, oh. I'm so um, yeah. So on, on the fiction side, um, uh, um, having worked with Sarah um, on, on acquiring books and things, one of the, it, it works very similar that, yeah, we spend a lot of our times with agents um, in particular on the, talking to agents to tell them like, these are the types of books we're looking for. You know, I, you know, we're publishing a whole bunch of uh, you know, space opera books in the next year or two. So, you know, not really looking for that at the moment, but what, you know, we really love for these types of stories and these types of voices um, and constantly having those kind of networking conversations so that, you know, as Molly said, as they're sort of doing that, that leg, that leg work and hustle that they will send our way the kinds of projects we're looking for. But um, it is a lot of time spent reading through, you know, pitched manuscripts from uh, from agents and, and reading through them page by page and book by book. Um, and if you find something you like, like bringing it to the slightly larger team, so like bringing it to the rest of the folks at Delray and saying, hey guys, you know, I'm really kind of liking this. Can I get some reads from the rest of the team? And can we have a little chat? Can I get some feedback just to get, you know, um, a bit of a barometer from the larger team about, you know, am I, is everyone else seeing what I'm seeing about, you know, how much I really like this project? Um, um, uh, and the same goes with, yeah, also looking at short story anthologies, people who are just writing novellas or writing short fiction, uh, maybe even flash fiction, and every once in a while reaching out to be like, hey, do you have an idea for a novel? Would you ever be interested in a novel? Um, and sometimes it's a case of an author is like, no, you know, I'm more of a short, short fiction person, or they're kind of an author who's working their way up and it's about, you know, kind of keeping in touch with them so that when they're ready to have their first novel that, you know, you've developed that relationship um, the way that, that Molly um, pointed out and that you have a, a chance to maybe publish it with them. So the answer to kind of all of the questions that you kind of asked is yes. It's like, yes, submitted, yes, um, from publications. Um, yes, you're, you know, responsible for some of that discoverability. Yeah, I would just, I would just yes. ask. Oh, Sarah, you're back. You're, you're back. back. Yeah. You go, Sarah. Hey. I was just going to thank Tom for absolutely reading my mind and saying everything I was about to say. Um, and I did want to point out, uh, sorry, Tom, if you said this while I was trying to fix my microphone. Um, but one thing that Molly said that I actually wanted to uh, call out really quickly is in nonfiction, a lot of things come in on proposal, whereas uh, on the fiction side and with Delray in particular, we get a lot of full manuscripts to um, evaluate so that's a slight difference in terms of you know what we're reviewing in, from agents but uh tom tom just like did a fantastic job thank you tom you're welcome i would just add one thing i would just add i think for as a young for younger editors who are just starting out and looking to acquire um you know like i don't want to get too in the weeds here but on on submit like submissions from agents you know there are Agents have typically lots of have editors that they go to with their with their submissions a lot, and they tend to be you know they're often like more senior editors, and so a lot of the stuff as a younger editor, it's it's hard for you to um, be the one who gets that in at Random House or whatever. So 
the more you can do as a young person to kind of create your own luck and to make connections and um, to meet authors and to write kind of like love notes to people who you think should write books, like that stuff all matters a lot. And it's really surprising to me um, how much of it pays off in some form down the road. Like people write back to you when you're, when you are an editor and you're writing to them saying you love what they do. And they'll often get on the phone with you to talk ideas. And, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not uncommon for that stuff to, to turn into um, a book at some point. So um, when you're starting out, the more that you can do, the more sort of entrepreneurial you can be as an editor, I think the better. Nice. Uh, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Are there editors who work strictly on craft elements like structural, plot-based, character development edits, et cetera? If so, what routes would you suggest to find a position in this vertical of editing? And we don't we don't have those people, at least at, at the Random House imprint. Um, I think it's sort of more of like a develop, developmental editor that, we're that you're talking about. I think um, often authors will hire those people um, on their own to help them with their books or agents will, will have, I think sort of like what we think of as book doctors who can come in and sort of help straighten out a manuscript if the author can't um, quite get on top of it. But no, we do, you know, like what we do at Random House, what Molly does, but what I do is we acquire the book, but then we also do all of the editorial work from the beginning of the process to the publication. Like we're, the, we're really the only editorial um, partner for the author from, from the moment we sign it up. Nice, thank you. Um, and we have one more question that I think really is a great way to sort of end the session. It's from Rachel. Looking back on your lives, would all of you choose your editing slash publishing slash licensing careers again, if you had the chance um, have the careers offered a good work-life balance? Yes, I would absolutely choose uh, my career path again. Um, giant nerd, what can I say? I love working on science fiction, fantasy, and horror. I feel like that kind of speculative fiction offers interesting and intriguing ways to get at the human condition, if I can be a little like, Ooh, for a minute. Um, but uh, work-life balance is interesting because I feel like the other day I was saying to someone uh, like 65% of my personality is being a sci-fi fantasy editor. Um, because as Tom mentioned, I think a thing that people don't realize is most of our nine to five is spent in meetings and administrative tasks and interfacing with all of the other groups within our publishing team, marketing, publicity, art and design, production. Um, and a lot of our actual editorial work happens outside of that nine to five, um, which, you know, I love this. This is my, my life and I love doing that. So I'm okay with that. But I do have to admit that my work-life balance is maybe a little bit more work uh, than life sometimes. A lot of reading. All right, I'll go. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I think what Sarah said, it's, I would not trade the, trade the job or the career for anything. I'd love it, but the work-life balance there, it's not a great work, work-life balance. It's, I say this to lots of people, but this is like truly a homework job. Um, all of the real work as an editor happens, you know, at night or, you know, a few hours each day on the weekend. And you're constantly, you have to constantly be chipping away at your, pile of editing or else you just get kind of overwhelmed. So um, the reading and the editing both take lots of time and they never, they never go away. So it's a matter of figuring out, you know, over the course of your career, how you're going to, you know, where you're going to find the time to do that, how you're going to carve it out. And um, because it's ultimately where the joy, the joy of the job is. Like I always find um, when I'm actually back into a book editing it, sometimes it's really hard to get started. But once I start, I think like I'm reminded of how how much I love doing doing what I do for a living. And it's easy to sort of just 
day, days go by, I'm on, you're on like eight Zoom calls a day or whatever, and you have all this stuff going on. Um, and the editing can seem like the thing that you're never getting to, but then once you're doing it, it's, uh, it's like, you know, if you like this kind of thing, it's, it's the best job in the world, so. Yeah, I'll just echo what, what Andy and Sarah have said, wouldn't trade it for anything, but you know, there's always something to be doing uh, when, when you're not necessarily on the clock. Um, and, and to Andy's point, I think once you're, I think every time I start editing a manuscript, I'm always, even after years of doing it now, I think I, I'm always sort of a little daunted by the thought of getting through it. And then by the time I get through it, I think how fun that was and I'm confused about where I found the time to do it. So I think there's a little bit of a mystery, I think to all of us about how we actually fit it in, but somehow we do and it's and it's the best part of it. Yeah, um, definitely echoing what everyone said. Having seen the alternative of a, a career that's about as different from publishing as you can get, um, I would choose publishing, you know, uh, every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Um, the, the one good thing though about the work-life balance is that while there is um, a, an emphasis on having to find time and, and, and create a schedule beyond the, the confines of nine to five to do the work, is that particularly as you progress in your career as an editor, you are the person who gets to control that schedule and gets to control figuring that out more and more. So, you know, if you're um, you do get to say, okay, my deadline to get this work done is this date here in the future. And um, as long as you can hit your deadlines and make sure that, you know, your schedule is not going to be holding up the other parts of publishing departments that need to be moving forward, you get to define, you know what, it's going to be Tuesday night that I take this on, not Wednesday, you know, and you actually do for as much extra work as you might have in homework that you might have, you also get a level of flexibility to define that extra work for yourself. And for all the work I've done outside of nine to five, I've never had to compromise and like miss a family event, a special occasion, miss out on taking vacations or doing the kinds of things that I want to do outside of work. Um, and I had to do that when I worked in accounting. I had to do that in other industries. I have friends who work in sort of more corporate industries who have to do those things because while they don't always, let's say, have homework, they don't have the kind of flexibility that I do. Um, so that that's the benefit. That's like the positive part of the, the work-life balance that you you have a level of control over it. And if you're good at scheduling and good at organization, all the things you need to be to be an editor, um, you can make it work around, you know, enjoying the, the, the free time that you have. Um, yeah, we have to take vacations because we have to find time to read for fun. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I love that. Um, Thank you all so much for being a part of this and for being the first installment of the series that we're doing. Um, we have two more that are happening. February 3rd, we're doing a series part two about marketing and pu publicity um, in publishing. Um, fun fact, I used to be a publicist at W.W. Norton, so I'm excited to talk more about it too. And February 17th, we're doing part three, which is about art and production. And yes, we're hoping as we continue to work with Penguin Random House and Libby to um, sort of create a sense of like an introduction to publishing a little bit more with some webinars, um, some other sort of info sessions and that sort of thing to really try to bridge the bind between NYC Publishing and Philadelphia and just working from home remote stuff. Um, thank you so much for spending an hour and answering these questions and it was an absolute pleasure to hear about your work. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. And hey, everyone. Bye, everyone. And like, have a great rest of your Wednesday. Yeah, good Wednesday. <laughs> good Wednesday, for sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Bye bye. <laughs>